So we want to relate, obviously, with our own kids. But we got to do that by asking relevant questions. Like we got to ask them something that they care about. And I often struggle with this myself to go, well, how do I show? How do I show in the questions that I ask them that this is important to me? This is important to them. And so maybe you can, um, you can describe like what are the, the questions that help us relate by asking? Yeah, so for me first, you know, and not, I'm not even talking about pedagogy right now, right? Like I'm talking about who I am as a person. I have to be relatable. Um, Dr. Rita Pearson said, rest in peace, a long time ago, that young people learn, don't learn from people that they don't like. And so I think it's important that we appear in a way that we are, re, you know, relatable and that we show that we actually care and that we love our students. And so I know that, you know, love um, is a feeling, well, it's, it's a feeling and, and it fluctuates. But Dr. Stephen R. Covey said in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People that love is also a verb. It's an action that you do even when you're not feeling it at the moment. It's unconditional, no matter what. And so if students see us as a person that cares about them, even if we are from a different background or we have a different um, um, culture or we're from a different race, that love and care, I believe, appeals to the humanity in each and every mm -hmm. person. Now, yeah. as far as um, pedagogy goes, I think that it's important to involve our children in thinking routines and in intellect. See, if your, if your work in the classroom is not intellectually challenging, right? Then how else are young people going to learn how to think and how to solve problems? You know, yeah, we do all the thinking for them. Why, why right. do we need to do any thinking, right? Right. <laughs> right. According to Mander, thinking is skilled work. It's not something that you're born, you know, that you can logically learn how to think on your own. It has to be taught. And so um, typically in schools, what we hear about is blooms. And so I do agree that most of the thinking routines or the, or or the frameworks for you know teaching kids how to think are are derived from from um, blooms there's also other ones so i think that a teacher needs to really think about what what would be a great problem solving strategy or or thinking framework for what they teach so i'm a computer science teacher so i use um, computational thinking First as a framework, which after repetition, it becomes a mindset. And that's how problems are solved in computer programming and in network design. So if I'm a social studies teacher, I would probably consider you know, design thinking. If I'm a science teacher, I would think of inquiry-based um, um, protocols for um, experiments, observations, you know, things like that. So I think it's important to have routines. Now, when I'm in a workshop, I focus on three main verbs, analysis, synthesis, evaluation. And so what I do is this, I have all of my participants either look at a picture, um, a video, or some informational text. And I want them to analyze and I let them know right now we are doing analysis. And then I ask them, what do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? Where are you stuck? So after they've analyzed and they have an idea, then they can design or they can synthesize or, or they can um, synthesize and make an artifact. And then evaluation, I use reflection for a metacognition. Because you, you know, like John Dewey said, we do not learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. And so for, for me, it's not just about being, you know, relatable, which is the first part, I think, but it's also about engaging them in learning. So you make them a learning partner first, and then you teach them the algorithms that they need 
in order to solve problems because that's really teaching someone how to fish hmm. and then they can do it on their own you know after they leave your class so okay i love this because what you're saying is like we're not learning by experience we're learning by reflecting on the experience and to me yeah. this is uh, a key point is that we often experience life and we just run through it and we do no reflection whatsoever. And to me, this is the key to relating. And I'm also curious, like, okay, this is the hardest part. It's just getting that conversation started is asking that first question. So to me, um, I like going back to that, that theme that we had earlier, like, what is that one question that we would ask, you know, potentially the the one that, that says, yeah, like I care about you and I care about like reflection and those kind of things. Like, how do I even get that? If I'm, if I'm hesitant as a parent, how do I get that conversation started? Um, and I guess it, it was like, maybe it's just like one sentence. Like it's those one single questions that you ask that it makes it like, yeah. oh, it's super clear. This is exactly why. Well, I like to ask my kids, um, even my wife. And even like my um, participants, I always ask them, what are three takeaways? And what are three things that you would do differently? And that's like my, you know, sentence starter. And so what I'm looking to do as a teacher is to activate HOTS, higher order thinking skills, right? They mm -hmm. don't know that, <laughs> but that, you know, I want them to think about their own thinking and, and, and to think about what their experience is. Now for, for adults, what I have found is that you talk about things that we've all seen. Some of us have experienced, but we've all seen. So I'll say something like, well, has anyone ever been into a bar or into a nightclub? And a lot of people say, yeah, I've been in there, I've been there. So I say, okay, now you'll see a lot of people having fun, but by the end of the night, you'll always see one person who's either like this, right? At the bar, at the end of the bar or on the pavement. And if you eavesdrop, that person is always saying, I'm never going to do that again. But they end up the next Friday night doing it again. And so what psychologists mm -hmm. say is that in that moment, they mean it. But because they didn't reflect appropriately on the natural consequence of the behavior to self and to others, they're doomed to repeat this over and over again. And so what I do with my child, um, who's 15 now, um, is, you know, I don't tell him that story, but I bring up, you know, situations he's been involved in, like where he went somewhere where he shouldn't be going, or he did something. And I just say, hey, what is your um, um, takeaway? And, and also what we have to understand is that, um, that the um, cortex, you know, in the brain, um, it needs mm -hmm. to, to um, connect with another part of the brain that, that, enables reasoning and critical thinking. And so that doesn't really fully develop until 25 years old. So that's why I'm saying we have to provide our, our children thinking frameworks that can eventually turn into mindsets. Wow. Because you can't do it on your own. You know, that's what science says. Now, I'm not saying everyone can't do it on their own, but you know, I know I, I couldn't. You know, once I had a system for solving problems, then I think I was unstoppable, like as far as learning goes. You know, it's like being in the kitchen and I have to make lasagna for the very first time. I need a <laughs> recipe. If I don't have a recipe, then what can I do? And so when I learned about um, project-based learning, I learned it through, through evidence-based instructional strategies and vetted educational protocols. And so I was doing workshops like that for five years, you know, using strategy after strategy. It was like a recipe. So eventually I became an expert. You know, that's how learning happens. You know, Tony Robbins says, repetition is the mother of skill. Um, Aristotle said, you are what you do repeatedly. And so once I got into the PhD program, then it was a little different because then I learned how, you know, how learning actually happens, meaning, I learned the theoretical frameworks and the learning theories that informed those practices. But prior to, I couldn't tell you why they worked. I could just tell you that they, I can show you that, that they do work. 
And so I think it's really a tandem of both. And if educators are fortunate enough to work in a school where they operate as PLCs and they're doing book studies and they're learning the research behind the practices that their school is asking them to do, then I think we have a win-win. If not, then I think it's very difficult to achieve something that we don't fully understand. So what I what I heard from you there was that, and I think this is like so important, and I, I, I just want to emphasize it, is like we are what we do repeatedly, and we often don't repeat enough of the, the things that we do. And I think it's that building that habit. And so what's happening is people are saying things, but they're not following up with action. So who is the person? Who is the person that follows up with that action? Right? Like if, if it's the parent or if it's the teacher, like who's going to hold them accountable? And that's the thing is like we live in a world without accountability these days. You know, like everybody is just, I want to say um, they, they do stuff. If you do it, or you don't do it. This is one of the big challenges I had with my son and his, uh, his class. Yo, you had a question. <laughs> yeah, well, so I don't have an answer for that. You know, that's the <laughs> only thing that I don't have an answer for that. The only thing I can do is be accountable for myself. I heard Tupac say this in an interview. I can't answer for anyone else, but I can answer for, for me. And so I have a neighbor and my neighbor, um, he's always giving me books to read. And one day, um, a few years ago, he was like, man, you have to read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you don't want to read the whole thing, just read one chapter on a very important concept. It's called the 10,000 hour rule. And so just in a nutshell, in the book, he talks about people that are at the top of their field. People like Steve Jobs, um, Bill Gates, Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, you know, Justin Bieber, you know, not that all these folks are, are in the book, but folks that, you know, that are at the top of their fields. The thing they have in common is the 10,000 hour rule, meaning that for 10 years, they dove into their topic for three hours a day, 20 hours a week, and maybe even more. And so when I found that out, you know, I basically, I treated my work like an NBA game. Like if I know that I'm doing a workshop and that workshop is for 90 minutes, I rehearsed that 90 minutes 14, 15 times before I even got there. And I got that from, from Michael Jordan. There's a book called Relentless, it's by Tim Grover. And that's what he talks about, you know. Sorry, Michael Relentless? Grover. It's called Relentless, yeah. Relentless, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so think about the analogy of of the you know of the workshop being 90 minutes. Well, if an NBA game is 43 minutes, Michael would practice 45 minutes or 90 minutes three times a day. So by the time he got to the game, he already played the game 15 times. And so for him, everything is slowed down, it's slow motion. And for everyone else, it's going fast and anxiety is building in. And so it's very important to, you know, get control of your emotions, right? Because we all have them. And that only happens through practice and repetition. Oh, I love that. I love that. So we have a, a few people who are on the call uh, right now. And, uh, you know, Roger asked a question. Maybe I'll see if I can bring it up here. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to the rituals and routines, children, zero to five, balancing, mastering skills and creativity. Any, any suggestions there for Roger? Well, I haven't um, taught um, children that, that young, except my own children. And so the thing that I've done with them is, you know, I focus a lot on being very mindful of what I'm saying to them. Um, there's a book called The Four Agreements. It's by Don Miguel Ruiz. And he said that, when people hear things, they either agree or they um, disagree. But when you're young, you tend to agree with everything, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately. And so it's important to tell your child, you know, positive things, right? You know, you are doing a good job. You can do anything that you do if you put your mind to it. You are smart, right? Things like that.
But I think focus on like, like I know, like me, like with like my young children, I made sure that they can cut on a straight line, that they can use a ruler, that they um, knew where to find things that, you know, in order um, um, to learn. But I would really focus on having them think through things. And I can't remember that 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 far, but I think that um, what we do in computer science is we have maker spaces and we allow them to um, um, tinker at a young age. And tinkering allows young people to you know play with things and and explore them in such a way that they start to see patterns. For example, if they're playing with um, electronics and they are um, I'm clicking on a switch, they start to see, you know, input, output. Now they don't make all these um, um, connections, but that eventually happens. Also video games. Now, um, I know that for small kids, um, I forgot what we had, um, you know, things on the iPad and things like that. But I think it's important that it's a tandem of telling them things that we should be saying to them, you know, positive things, right? Helping them through their um, um, difficult emotions but also in having them explore and play. And um, um, tinkering, I don't think is what we need to do as they get older as much, but I think it's a great intro into learning um, concrete skills. And I, I hope that that, that so was much, helpful. George. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope that that's helpful. Um, you know, I never yeah. taught from zero through five, so. Uh, let us know if it was helpful. And in the meantime, I'm maybe I can add that you know, to me, I love this, especially for the zero to five years old, I found that they're constantly looking for approval, right? And so if you can tell them like, wow, you did this thing, and it was so good, like, I am so proud of you for doing this, they need constant encouragement and constant positive direction. And they often, do they get it from home? Do they get it like as, as you know, do they get it from school? Maybe the teachers in their class are too busy to give praise to every single individual. You need to be there to give some of that praise on a regular basis. So building a habit of going certain things that I love to see from you are going to receive praise is such a powerful, powerful way of getting them towards uh, like the kinds of behaviors, kind of habits, the kinds of the, the, the practice that you said that is 10,000 hours. Uh, the Malcolm Gladwell hours, you know, that those are really, really key.